Lauren Snell here and welcome back to High Intensity Business, the podcast where we discuss high intensity strength training and provide you with the tools, the tactics, and the strategies to grow your strength training business. To download and read the transcript for this podcast, please go to highintensitybusiness.com, search for episode 369, and there you can find the uh, transcript download button to get that transcript. So today we are going to be talking about how to decide on your trainer and I guess wider team dress code in your business. Um, today's guest to talk about that is Discover Strength founder and CEO, Luke Carlson, who's been on the podcast multiple times. I thought there was no better person again to, to bring on to really talk about this and dive into the different possibilities and how we decide on what's the best fit for our business. So welcome, Luke. Good to see you again. Good to see you. And thanks for having me, Lawrence. It's always a pleasure to join you. Pleasure is all mine. So we're talking about dress code today, meaning, you know, when people launch a, launch a high intensity training business, they're thinking about okay, what do we, what what do how do we want our trainers to be presented? Do we want them to be wearing shirts and ties? Do we want them to wear athletic leisure wear? Something in between, like smart casual, which is kind of what we've gone for in our business. Um, and I guess I, I, I guess it's it's important to understand, you know, what are the factors that go into making the right decisions around that? Um, and obviously, it's important because. If you're not deliberately thinking about dress code in the context of your strategy and brand, then you're probably making a mistake, right? Um, so I'll let you I'll let you riff for a bit. What, what what comes to mind for you when thinking about how you decide on a dress code for your personal training business? So as as small or as nuanced as this topic is, it's a topic that I'm really interested in because I have an emotional connection to you know, how we landed on the dress code that we've landed on and not that it's the right dress code. It's just probably the right dress code for us right now. But I remember visiting, I was 22 years old and I visited the Gainesville health and fitness center, which has now been renamed Gainesville health and fitness. So I'm 22, I'm a senior in college. And, um, I had just hosted a conference in Minneapolis and this is before rec and we had strength training people from all over attend it was it was nuts i was 22 and it was actually bigger than any rec we've ever hosted and uh maybe it was easier to get people to, to come to events like that in the past and jim flanagan came and he basically was a vendor and uh was selling the avenger like press and so afterwards he said why don't you come down to florida and we'll spend some time together and i had never met jim flanagan in person so on this incredible trip to florida I got to meet Arthur Jones for the first time and hang out in his family room and got to meet Ken Hutchins and got to meet, um, you know, obviously spent time with Jim Flanagan and we drove, you know, uh, to Arthur's old home, the ranch, you know, Cala, we did all the things. Well, one of those visits was Gainesville Health and Fitness. And I walked in and everybody was wearing a shirt and tie. All of the males had blue dress shirts of some kind and a tie. And all of the women, regardless of what your role was, if you were working at the front desk, if you're uh, working on the exercise floor, regardless of what your role was, you had a blue blouse or kind of dress shirt and uh, professional slacks. And then the owner, Joe Cerulli, had the same thing. He had a blue dress shirt on and a tie. And this is a massive health club, right? It is, you know, they keep expanding it. So in 2002, I don't know if it was... 70,000 square feet or 80,000 square feet, but it's, it was big. And I was just in awe, not just of the club, I was in awe of the professionalism and the consistency. And so I, I landed on one word there. The word was, and, and I, it's so important. This is, this is, I think, the central conversation of, of our podcast today. The word is intentionality. You know, I, it, when I walked out of there, I understood that Gainesville Health and Fitness, their leadership was intentional about everything they did. But today we're talking about dress code. They were intentional about what they were going to wear. And I just thought, OK, so I don't have to do a shirt and tie. I don't have to do a blue shirt, but I should probably be intentional. And so to me, intentional means if someone asked you, why did you make that decision? Why are you doing this? You'd have a number of, of responses. And I don't think those responses have to be evidence-based. I don't think those responses have to be supported by, um, you know, marketing and sales data, thought leadership from Jim Collins or Marcus Buckingham 
or Patrick Lencioni. I just think you as a leader have to be able to say, this is why we did this. And um, I'll end this riff in just a second. But what I find fascinating in our space, right? I mean, Joe Cerulean Gainesville Health and Fitness is a massive health club that does everything. I mean, they have yoga and basketball and Pilates and a full physical therapy clinic and everything that a club has from swimming pools to you name it. They also have more medics machines under one roof than any club on earth. And at the time, uh, they didn't have X-Force. Now they have all the X-Force equipment also. Um, What I find fascinating is most of your listeners and my wonderful friends and colleagues in this space are really intentional about equipment. I mean, intentional about equipment. Like people are trading out their pullover and on the third version of a pullover, because they found this pullover was available, used, and it's going to be better than their previous pullover. And they like the strength curve more. And in fact, (laughs) they bought a different machine and they shaved down the cam. So the strength curve is even better. And then they had it retrofitted so that there was Kevlar strap traveling over the cam instead of a chain. We are insanely intentional about equipment choice. Um, But there's a lot of other areas we're not so intentional about. And I think the customer sees and experiences all of our brand, not just the things that we're passionate about or the things that directly impact the workout. So, you know, if I'm I'm listening to this discussion, I would interject and say, well, obviously we're intentional about the equipment. That is what your physiology is actually interacting with. That's what your, 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 how the resistance is applied to our working muscles. And I agree with that, but I don't know if the target market, I don't know if our customer thinks that that's the only element of the brand that they're actually purchasing. So I think the key word is intentionality. And when we wrap up today, I'm not going to tell people, you know, who am I to tell people what exactly, you know, is the perfect dress code for a business, but you better be intentional about it. And I don't, I don't think we're necessarily intentional. Now, intentional means just what I said, you have rationale for why you're doing it. Intentional doesn't mean you're on the spot making up some BS about why you chose it. I mean, it's got to be, there's a reason for it. Mm, Got it. Awesome way to start. So just developing from there, because I had here, I had some notes about, okay, you know, I think that's probably important to have a strategy to have, you know, to have gone perhaps through something like EOS and traction and decided on, you know, what your, what your vision is for your business and what you want your, um, brand to be about um, and then use that for helping out with these kinds of decisions right so how how do you think one should go about figuring out what is the best fit for them in their their business what what filters would you would use if any so i'm going to use the scary word that nobody really knows what the definition is it's what's your brand all about and and we don't have to dive into all the elements of brand and what it means, but I think you would ask this. You'd have to ask this question of yourself and of your company. Uh, what do you want to be known for, right? When the when the customer thinks about you, what do you want them to think about? Um, when they talk about you to their friends, what do you want them to say? Um, when they talk uh, about you to referral sources, what kind of adjectives should be coming up? What what are people saying about you? And when I, when I say you, I mean the company, the workout experience, you as the owner, your staff, et cetera. So those things are on the periphery of brand. You know, when when the customer thinks about your brand, what feelings, or when they think about you, what feelings um, are elicited? And so I think that's the starting point. And so let me just make that a little bit more practical. For us, our first studio was not an attractive location. It was like the only location that was available that I could afford. Now, fast forward 16 years later, we've run the really expensive Buxton analysis of the demographic in the area. And it turns out it's an awesome area. I told people for like, I don't know, the last 15 years that our first location was not in the the right spot. And we just made it happen because we're great operators. That's not true. It turned out (laughs) it's a really good spot, but the physical space itself was not nice. We didn't have good co-tenancy. We, um, you know, it was just not an attractive space. So we signed the lease, we painted the walls, you know, ourselves. Um, we picked out, I picked out the carpet and we had the carpet put in. And, you know, I went to a store that had big front desks and we bought a front front desk and just dropped it in there. Literally my, my mom and I drove and we picked out desks together. So, but we did have really great equipment. 
So we bought all brand new. There was nothing in there that was used. All brand new Medex, Hammer Strength, Nautilus 2ST, Nautilus Nitro equipment. About 60% of it was Medex. The rest of it was a balance of the other things. And so we had great equipment. And then from day one, we wore shirts and ties. You know, we just had our 16 year anniversary and I was going and looking at old photos and I was looking at, it was like my third day at work. And I still remember my first day of work, what shirt and tie I wore. You know, I was not used to wearing a shirt and tie. So I was like, I can't believe I'm going to be doing this every day. And so we just decided that when someone walks in the door, we didn't want to feel. So here's the key word to brand is feel, right? The feelings that are elicited by your customer. We didn't want the, the customer to feel like they were in a gym. That was just our thing. I just didn't like the word gym. Like it actually hurt my feelings when someone said, how's the gym going? <laughs> yeah. And then, and now I don't care. Right? I just, I mean, I, I don't mind the word gym as much now, but then it was like, it is not a gym. And so when someone walked in the door, I wanted them to understand right away that we were not a gym. So it's, it's what's the feeling that you want to listen to when someone thinks about you? The second thing that I considered, and I don't have a, a long list. This is the last thing I considered is how could we be differentiated? And I didn't know anything about three uniques and that uniques were the foundation of strategy, but I did know that I don't want to be like everybody else out there. And everybody else out there was wearing at the time was wearing like Nike and Under Armour athletic clothing. This is before Lululemon existed. And I thought that was a good look. Like I was a strength and conditioning coach in high schools and in professional football. And we had just awesome athletic attire. Like we had all of this great Nike stuff and we had our logo with a barbell through it. And, you know, like we were into the attire, like everybody got just tons of great attire when I was a high school strength coach, college strength coach, NFL strength coach. And I thought that was, was awesome. I loved wearing that stuff, but everybody was wearing that. So I knew that wouldn't make us different. We needed to find a way to be different from, from, you know, any other workout experience somebody could have. So from a visual standpoint, when you walked in the door, you saw that we were wearing shirts and ties. Now, when I hired my first staff, I told them when someone walks in the door, a client works with us, they're, they're, they're really paying us a lot of money. We're charging a lot of money. I mean, everybody in this room is 26 years old or younger. Like I was the senior person in the room at 26 years of age. Everybody else was 22 or 23 years of age. And so I said, we have to command a certain amount of professionalism or communicate a certain amount of professionalism. So I just want to err on the side of wearing a shirt and tie. Now, let me fast forward to 2022. I have, a, it's probably more than one, but I have a, a client who's a wonderful VP involved in marketing for one of the biggest retailers in the world. And this person will have coffee with me every now and then and say, hey, I hate that you wear shirts and ties. <laughs> She'll really do mock-ups of all the different clothing that our staff should be wearing. And she says, well, no one's wearing <laughs> shirts and ties anymore. Even bankers don't wear shirts and ties. And in the back of my head, all I'm thinking is that's even more reason that we would continue. Yeah, to sure. Like I'm, I'm okay with that. Now I do want to have a, a, an awareness or a sensitivity that, and, and believe me, I didn't know this. 16 years ago, and I didn't know this two years ago, that maybe a shirt and tie is actually promoting or bias toward uh, men or males and, you know, males, you know, being powerful in the workplace. So I, I don't think that's a good thing, but we never said it was a shirt and tie. It was just a male wore a shirt and tie and a female wore the equivalent, which was, you know, a professional clothing of some kind. And you know, today we say that our dress code is gender neutral. So you could wear a shirt and tie as a female if you want to. So I do have a little bit of awareness of that. Um, I, I don't know if I buy into it. I would say I have an awareness of it. So that's yeah. that's the filters is the brand, the, the feeling and the emotion you want elicited when someone walks into your, your business. And then the second one is, well, could you make a choice that actually makes you different from the rest of the competition that's out there? Our goal is not to look good. Our goal is to look a little bit different. Now, then I find out down the road that every super slow place on earth just does shirts and ties. And I thought, oh, okay, I guess I'm not so different, but there was no super slow places where we were. So it was different for us. And, you know, people would always say, oh, you really had that Ken Hutchins influence. And I thought, well, no, I, I didn't know that they were doing this. I just, I went into Gainesville Health and Fitness and they were wearing shirts and ties. Was he, who was, who influenced Joe? And his desire to do that. Yeah. I don't know. The, the oldest pictures I ever saw of Joe, he always had a shirt and tie on, like in the club. Like this is in the like the you know early 80s and late 70s. 
And so I think it was in that era, you just wore a shirt and tie to work. Yeah. You know? that's, so I think yeah. Just, he spread it to anybody that was working in the health club. Perhaps a generational thing then. Yeah. And yeah. I had I had never thought about the potential derogatory connotation that you just mentioned, which I don't think I buy into either, but it's um it's 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 interesting to think about. Um does it does it ever bother you or did it ever bother you? Oh, I've got to put a because I, 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 obviously there's a, there's something about wearing a shirt and tie and wearing a nice watch where you just feel great. You know, you just feel confident, you feel like a professional and you probably perform better at whatever it is you're doing for the most part. Um, uh, when you, when you feel good about how you look, um, so there is a, I can see a massive positive, but do you ever, does it ever bother you? And, and I suspect it occasionally does bother the team that they have to wear a shirt and tie. And, and how do you feel about that? And how do you address that? So actually, I think no. And it was a big concern I had early on. And I thought, well, we're, we're not going to be able to hire people. They're not going to want to do this. But I actually think it's been a little bit of a positive because, yeah. again, every place else they've interviewed, they you know are going to wear athletic attire. And so it's like, whoa, this this there's a sense that this this business has been intentional. There's some thought behind this and this is a little bit different and I want to be a part of that. And, and I think maybe it's the people that we hire are like, okay, I can, I can get on board with this. Let's be clear. If we ever say, Hey, you know, we're coming to this meeting and it's casual attire. They love that. They don't want to always wear a shirt and tie. So let me be a little bit more clear about what our dress code is. It's shirt and tie or dress clothes Monday through Friday. Saturday and Sunday, we have what we call weekend attire. So you wear dress pants. So you wear slacks on Saturday and Sunday. And then everybody, when they're hired, is given a Nike Discover Strength polo. Um, so you can wear that. And then there's some substitutes that we allow. So you can wear like a, a, a Nike quarter zip top with a Discover Strength logo on it. So that's what we wear on Saturday and Sunday. If someone works on a holiday, we usually let them wear weekend attire on that on that holiday. So this past Monday uh, was Memorial Day in in the U.S. and I, I worked a shift at one of our locations, and we just sent oh, out. A I saw that. I was going to email you say, Luke, where's the shirt and tie? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so we sent out a message saying, hey, you know, if you're working on this this weekend, it's it's a weekend att- or Excuse me, if you're working on this holiday, it's weekend attire. So we'll we'll often do that. Uh, that's that's where we landed. Okay. So this is great. And um, you talked about a few potential filters, you know, intentionality, you know, what, what, what do you want to be known for? You know, how do you make this congruent of your brand? And there's a great book. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. No, I'm just excited to share another, another thought, but I want you to tell me about that book. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Well, no, you, you put me on to um, Denise Leon, if that's how I say her name, uh, great brands do brand as business. Um, it's her book, I believe, and um, or Brand as Business, and it's it's great. Um, I've just started listening to it, and I've had to actually pause it to finish what else I'm listening to and reading to make sure that I go all in on it. Um, and I love her her you know her summary. It's brand is what you do and how you do it. Right, that's the simple definition. Um, so I will put that in the show notes if people want to dive into you know understanding brand and and really improving that aspect of their business. Um, but one of the other filters which you hinted at when you were talking about the professionalism you wanted to communicate as a business is um, understanding that you know you're you're charging for personal training it's a, a premium price point and you've got to have all these different factors congruent with that um, and it got me thinking about you know your target market and this applies to I guess lots of our colleagues are you know affluent busy professionals they they are used to a high level of service. They, like you told me, you know, they eat at lovely restaurants, they stay at nice hotels. They're kind of accustomed to a, at least a baseline level of service. And so one filter is designing, obviously designing the business around that individual and dressing accordingly. Now that doesn't necessarily mean shirt and tie, um, but it perhaps does perhaps mean that you shouldn't be a scruff bag, you know? So that's, that's another filter potentially, but love your thoughts on that. And, and you'll see that thought you've got stirring away as well. Lawrence, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, I've probably repeated that 10,000 times over the last 16 years. But as the world gets away from shirts and ties, like you said, it doesn't mean shirt and tie. I think what our target market is used to is they're used to intentional brand experiences. So whether it's a hotel, a restaurant, a massage, they're expecting the whole experience to be um, connected, uh, all the brand touch points to have some synergy, right? So, 
I think that's what's important. Now, let me go back to, um, we talk so much about the workout, but the customer experience, one of the big influences for us on a shirt and tie, and one of the ways we explain it to our staff is, and I got this from the Ritz Carlton, is we want to have a ready to serve mentality, okay? Uh, ready to serve. So if you stay at a Ritz Carlton hotel, you know, when you get there, there's going to be someone dressed to the nines just to open the door for you to walk into the hotel. And if you stop and look at that person, you should be saying to yourself, hold on, the whole reason you're wearing this shirt and tie and, and maybe white gloves, I, I don't know. The reason you're dressed the way you are is because you got ready to serve me today. Ready to serve can be demonstrated in someone's attire. The only reason you're wearing a shirt and tie is so you can open the door for me. Wow. Okay. So we say the same thing with our workouts, ready to serve. Now, uh, you know, on everyone's first day of employment, I say, you can give someone an equally good workout wearing your pajamas. Of course you can. But by wearing a shirt and tie in our case, you are demonstrating that you got ready to serve the customer. So that is powerful communication. The second the client walks in the door, that there was preparation going into this. I'm a ready to serve mentality. Now you ask the question about our staff. I think our staff have this strong emotional demarcation that when I put the shirt and tie on, it is ready to serve mentality. Like it is time to go. One of the biggest issues I see in our space is all of our studios, okay, our, our co wonderful colleagues and friends, their studios become like a second home to them. Well, why? Because they spend so much time there, but it's also like they're passionate about it. They care way more about their equipment than they do about the furniture in their own home. Well, their studio becomes almost like a second living room to them mm -hmm. and they want to be comfortable and they want to have the, the music that they like on. And uh, they want to dress the way that they would dress, you know, if they were really in a comfortable environment and it becomes a little bit of a man cave, you know, and some of these, you know, <laughs> it's, you could argue that maybe it's intentional that it's it's become that, but I think we have to we have to think about the customer's experience and hold on, are we being too relaxed and are we almost letting someone into our man cave rather than no, this is actually a business and we want them to experience um, and we want to elicit certain feelings and emotions as a part of this experience. Mm, yeah, yeah, and um, just to just to tag onto that, you know. You're, you're talking about customer experience, this getting ready to serve. And you know, you've talked, and we were talking before this podcast at length about the importance of the workout and the customer experience and how that's really for a long time been, been uh, not focused on enough by our colleagues who are sort of looking for the, that new sort of magic marketing secret when really they, they probably need to just hone that customer experience in the workout. Um, and, and they'll then be generating many more referrals and obviously retaining more clients. And this is, this is one component in that for you, isn't it? For discover strength. It's, it's, it's that ready to service that customer experience. And it's also that talk trigger. It's that thing that they're going to talk about with their friends after they work out, Hey, you know what? Discover strength, they all wear shirt and ties. It's really strange, really different. Um, and that's going to ultimately drive more referrals. So can you speak on the talk trigger aspect or any thoughts on what I've just said? And so, yeah, I agree with everything you said. So talk trigger is what can you operationalize in your business that people are going to talk about, that they're going to comment on and people comment on, oh, that's the place that they wear shirts and ties. No one has ever left a gym and said, oh, that's the place they wear Nike and Lululemon. Well, obviously that's every gym on earth. No one's going to comment on that. So it becomes a talk trigger. It's something that, that people actually mention after the workout. And we actually think we only have a couple of talk triggers. One of the talk triggers is the intensity that I just got absolutely pummeled for 30 minutes. That's a talk trigger. So let's be clear. If you're training to shy of momentary muscle failure, or maybe just a momentary muscle failure, that's not a talk trigger, right? Like that's, no one's going to say, can you believe I, I went to two reps shy of failure? That was you know, <laughs> something special. But when you go to failure and then you use some advanced overload techniques, that's a talk trigger. People will always talk about it. Um, and, 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 and one of the many reasons I know that is, you know, we host a conference every year and we do early morning workouts and we train people just like we train every one of our clients and everyone that does that workout talks about the workout afterwards. Mm. And we're thinking, why are they talking about it? This is normal. This is what we do. Literally, you know, every one of our staff does it 12 times a day, every single day. So our staff are baffled by it. And I, mm. they just don't realize that not everybody trains that way. So it's a talk trigger, right? So regardless of whether or not it's the right 
physiological decision. It is a talk trigger. So wearing a shirt and tie is a talk trigger. Someone's going to talk about it after the fact. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So let's just, um, I guess, wrap up by talking about some various options. Um, you know, I just had a few written down here. I mean, there's maybe there's many more, but you've got shirts and ties, you've got smart casual, which is kind of what we're going for. It's, it's not something we've, we've, uh, we're, we're kind of at the moment, it's, it's, you know, chinos, trousers, smart shoes, trainers, kind of, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, Luke, you're way more uh, fashionable than me. So you probably know all the lingo, um, you know, with like a nice fitted, uh, like polo with like a fleece, like a, or something like that, or a pullover, you'd call it, wouldn't you? Um, and, and that's kind of our thing. But what I'm thinking about doing is going, moving over to shirts and trousers, but no tie. So open neck, nice trousers, slacks, as you would say, you know, that kind of look. And then like a V-neck jumper sort of thing, like for the colder months. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of where, where we're headed and, and we're yet to really push a button on that, but that's what we're going to do. And then obviously you've got athletic leisure, which is ubiquitous, right? It's what every one of our competitors is doing. Um, and, and like you say, it's this, that homogeneity, it's that lack of differentiation. And, and maybe that's not a problem if that's not what they're using to differentiate, right? Um, but um, do you have any thoughts on what you see out there in terms of attire and, and what the options are for people? Yeah, so I think um, I, I really look at it in our little space is there's kind of like three options or three kind of points on a continuum. And so um, on the far uh, end, there's shirts and ties or, or dress clothes. Uh, the other far end, it's purely athletic attire. So it's like you're literally wearing, um, you know, yoga pants, workout pants, Lululemon, Nike, you know, shirts of all different kinds. And the middle to me is always like a polo shirt that's tucked in, in, in some way. Now, I think that the key is intentionality, right? So I think that I should, I should walk in and understand that whoever's, this is my opinion, that whoever's working there, they got dressed to go to work, right? I talked before about the ready to serve uh, approach. So I'll just give some examples of, of brands that are out there. Like I love what Fit20 does. So Fit20 appears to be some type of slack uh, or pant, and then they have some type of, we would say, um, you know, vest, uh, quarter zip, um, you might say, uh, what is it, gilet, gilet, um, <laughs> James is going to give me a hard time that I don't have, right? <laughs> we, we don't say jumper in the US, but then yeah. and it has logo on it, and maybe they wear a dress shirt under it, they have a look, right, so I know that person, if I saw them at the grocery store, I know that they just came from work or they're about to go to work. That's their work attire. So I think I should understand that you got ready to serve and you intentionally are wearing whatever you're wearing because you're at work right now. So whether that's logo, et cetera. So if you're going to go on the far you know, end of the spectrum and wear athletic attire, that's fine. Just have it all be logoed. I, I think that's a unbelievable yeah. look, an unbelievable look, but everybody has to have the logo on. You know, we're in the, the backyard of the largest health club company in the world, Lifetime Fitness, and they go athletic, but everybody is wearing logoed Lifetime Fitness attire in there. Now, I think they could pick better looking attire, but at least it's all logoed and it's brand consistent. When I look around, I know who works there. And you may say, well, in my studio, everybody knows that I work there. That's clear. But I still think we have to dress in a way where we're representing that intentionality. Now, there's a step beyond that. I used to wrestle with the idea that, well, professionals don't wear uniforms. So like your dentist, your doctor, your attorney doesn't wear a uniform that's got like a name tag, et cetera, right? That's what you would you know, get if you checked into a hotel, they have to have a uniform on, but a true professional doesn't wear a uniform. They just dress professionally. So I think I was kind of turned on by that. And I just said, all right, we're not going to have our people wear a uniform. We're just going to say dress up. So I'll actually go one step further. Um, Gainesville Health and Fitness in the last few years have changed the dress shirt and tie to a Gainesville Health and Fitness dress shirt and tie, where they have a logo on the dress shirt. That's not what we want to do. We're not going to go that far because we want to just say, just like your attorney, uh, as an example, an accountant would just put dress clothes on and wear whatever they wanted. That's what we're going to do. So there's intentionality there, but it's not, hey, we have to put on this specific uniform. It sounds like I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth because over here with the athletic attire, I was saying you got to have logos. 
With the dress attire, I was saying you want to avoid logos. I just think you have to be intentional about that. Do you view your people as professionals and therefore you don't think they should truly wear uniforms? I think is a big decision, a big discussion. And what would you think of the, the benefits beyond? We talked about not not excluding what we've already spoken about. So, you know, talk trigger, sure. Um, but do you think there's other benefits? Like, you know, it does enable you to perhaps charge a higher fee. It does enable you to attract a different type of customer. It does enable you to be associated with medical professionals that are perhaps seen as being more elite than a standard personal trainer. I agree with almost that. everything you said, except that last part, because I think there's more okay. doctors that are going to CrossFit where, you know, and they're not dressed professionally than anywhere else. So I don't think that doctors actually care. I just think that the customer has to, has to experience brand congruency. And so you can't say that you're the smartest and you're an expert and, and, and not be intentional about how you're dressing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Well, that's covered off my list. Any final thoughts on dress code that you want to share? I think we, we, uh, we we hit it uh, from all angles. We did. We did. Um, and uh, just before we wrap up here, um, we wanted to mention that Luke and I collaborated some time ago on a couple of courses, um, which you can check out on the website over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash products. Um, and it's a fantastic course I recently revisited called How to Build a Million Dollar Training Gym. You can tell Luke's far more happy about using the word gym um, these days. Uh, and it's just an incredible course. It's like three hours of pure gold. And I went through it recently and identified a lot of challenges and issues that we need to address and, and find it so beneficial. So you can go and check that course out. And then there's build a website that generates clients of Hannah Johnson, your VP of sales marketing, and there's a few others as well. So if you're interested in uh, checking out those courses, just go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash products. Um, and to find the blog post for this episode and download the PDF transcript, please go to highintensitybusiness.com. Search for episode 369. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. 